everyone and welcome back to our chapter read along with James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. So we are nearly, well we're past halfway I think, there's our bookmark and we are on chapters 24 through 26 today. So we're going to do our quick review. So pause the video if you want to review it with those who you're watching this with. If not, Here's my quick review up to where we are in the book. So we are following our friend James Henry Trotter as he goes on an adventure in a giant peach. He got away from his mean Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker on this giant magical peach with his new friends, Miss Glowworm, Mr. Grasshopper, Miss Ladybug, Mr. Centipede, Mr. Earthworm, Miss Spider, and the Silkworm. So they rolled down the English countryside and fell into the ocean. Last time, they were being attacked by sharks, and James had a brilliant idea to use the rope from our friends Miss Spider and Miss Silkworm and use the Earthworm as bait to gather as many seagulls as they could, and now the peach is floating in the air. So we come to our friends as they have just made this miraculous plan happen. And they are floating over the ocean. We are on chapter 24. But up on the peach itself, everyone was still happy and excited. I wonder where we'll finish up this time, the earthworm said. Who cares, they answered. Seagulls always go back to the land sooner or later. Up and up they went, high above the highest clouds, the peach swaying gently from side to side as it floated along. Wouldn't this be the perfect time for a little music, the ladybug asked. How about it, old grasshopper? With pleasure, my dear lady. The old green grasshopper answered, bowing from the waist. Oh, hooray! He's going to play for us! They cried, and immediately the whole company sat themselves down in a circle around the old green musician, and the concert began. From the moment that the first note was struck, the audience became completely spellbound. And as for James, never had he heard such beautiful music as this. In the garden at home on summer evenings, he had listened many times to the sound of grasshoppers chirping in the grass and had always liked the noise they made. But this was a different kind of noise altogether. This was real music, chords, harmonies, tunes, all the rest of it. And what a wonderful instrument the old green grasshopper was playing on. It was like a violin. It was almost exactly as though he were playing upon a violin. The bow of the violin, the part that moved, was his back leg. The strings of the violin, the part that made the sound, was the edge of his wing. He was using only the top of his back leg, the thigh, and he was stroking his up, this up and down against the edge of his wing with incredible skill. Sometimes slowly, sometimes fast, but always with the same easy flowing action. It was precisely the way a clever violinist would have used his bow, and the music came pouring out, filled the whole blue sky around them with magic melodies. When the first part was finished, everyone clapped madly, and Miss Spider stood up and shouted, Bravo! Encore! Give us more! Did you like that, James? The old green grasshoppers asked, smiling at the small boy. Oh, I loved it, James answered. It was beautiful. It was though as though a real violin was in your hands. A real violin, the old green grasshopper cried. Good heavens, I like that. My dear boy, I am a real violin. It is part of my own body. But do all grasshoppers play their music on violins the same way you do? James asked. No, he answered, not at all. If you want to know, I happen to be a short-horned grasshopper. I have two short feelers coming out of my head. Can you see them? There they are. They're quite short, aren't they? 
That's why they call me Shorthorn. There's Mr. Grasshopper and his Shorthorns. And we Shorthorns are the only ones who play our music in the violin style, using a bow. My longhorned relatives, the ones who have long curvy feelers coming out of their heads, make their music simply by rubbing the edges of their top wings together. They are not violinists, they are wing rubbers. And a rather inferior noise these wing rubbers produce too. If I may say so, it sounds more like a banjo than a fiddle. How fascinating this all is, cried James. And to think that up until now, I had never even wondered how a grasshopper made his sounds. My dear young fellow, the old green grasshopper said gently, there are a whole lots of things in this world of ours that you haven't started to wonder about yet. Where, for example, do you think I keep my ears? Your ears? Why, on your head, of course. Everyone burst out laughing. You mean you don't even know that? cried the centipede. Try again, the old green grasshopper said, smiling at James. You can't possibly keep them anywhere else. Oh, can I? Well, I give up. Where do you keep them? Right here, the old green grasshopper said, one side of my tummy. That's not true. Of course it's true. What's so particular about that? You ought to see where my cousins, the crickets, and the katydids keep theirs. Where do they keep them? In their legs. One in each front leg, just below the knee. You mean you didn't know that either? The centipede said scornfully. You're joking, James said. Nobody could possibly have ears on his legs. Why not? Because it's ridiculous, that's why. You know what I think is ridiculous, the centipede said, grinning away as usual. I don't mean to be rude, but I think it's ridiculous to have ears on the sides of one's head. It certainly looks ridiculous. You ought to take a peek in the mirror someday and see for yourself. Pest, cried the earthworm. Why do you always have to be so rude and rambunctious to everyone? You ought to apologize to James at once. Chapter 25 James didn't want the earthworm and centipede to get into another argument, so he said quickly to the earthworm, Tell me, do you play any kind of music? No, but I do other things, some of which are really quite extraordinary, the earthworm said, brightening. Such as what? asked James. Well, the earthworm said, next time you stand in a field or in a garden, look around you. Then just remember this, every grain of soil upon the surface of the land, every tiny bit of soil that you can see has actually passed through the body of an earthworm during the last few years. Isn't that wonderful? That's not possible, James said. My dear boy, it's a fact. You mean you actually swallow soil? Like mad, the earthworm said proudly, in one end and out the other. But what's the point? What do you mean, what's the point? Why do you do it? We do it for the farmers. It makes the soil nice and light and crumbly so that things will grow in it. If you really want to know, the farmers couldn't do it without us. We are essential. We are vital. So that's the only natural that the farmers would love us. He loves us even more, I believe, than he loves the ladybug. The ladybug, James said, turning to look at her. Do they love you too? I'm told they do, the ladybug answered modestly, blushing all over. In fact, I understand that in some places the farmers love us so much that they go out and buy live ladybugs by the sackful and take them home and set them free in their fields. But why? James asked. Because we gobble up all the nasty little insects that they're gobbling up the farmer's crops. It helps enormously, and we ourselves don't charge a penny for our services. I think you're wonderful, James told her. Can I ask you one special question? Please do. Is it really true that you can tell how old a ladybug is by counting her spots? Oh no, that's just a children's story, the ladybug said. We never change our spots. 
Some of us, of course, are born with more spots than others, but we never change them. The number of spots that a ladybug has is simply the way of showing which branch of the family she belongs to. I, for example, as you can see for yourself, am a nine-spotted ladybug. I am very lucky. It's a fine thing to be. <laughs> yes, indeed, said James, gazing at her beautiful scarlet shell and the nine black spots on it. On the other hand, the ladybug went on, some of my less fortunate relatives have no more than two spots altogether on their shells. Can you imagine that? They are called two-spotted ladybugs, and very common and ill-mannered they are, I regret to say. And then, of course, you have this five-spotted ladybugs as well. They are much nicer than the two-spotted ones, although I myself find them a rifle too saucy for my taste. But... They are all of them loved, said James. Yes, the ladybug answered quietly. They are all of them loved. It seems like everyone here around here is loved, he said. How nice it is. Not me, said the centipede happily. I'm a pest and proud of it. Oh, I am such a shocking, dreadful pest. Here, here, said the earthworm. What about you, Miss Spider, said James. Aren't you much loved or in the world? Alas, no, Miss Spider answered, sighing long and loud. I am not loved at all, and yet I do nothing but good. All day long, I catch flies and mosquitoes in my webs. I'm a decent person. I know you are, said James. It's very unfair the way we spiders are treated, Miss Spider went on. Why, only last week, my own, your own horrible aunt sponge flushed my poor dear father down the plug hole in the bathtub. Oh, how awful, James cried. I watched the whole thing from a corner up in the ceiling. It was ghastly. I never saw him again. A large tear rolled down the che her cheek and fell to the splash on the floor. Sorry. Ah, my dog wants to go outside. But is it not very unlucky to kill a spider? James inquired, looking around at the others. Of course it's unlucky to kill a spider, shouted the centipede. It's about the unluckiest thing anyone can do. Look what happened to Aunt Sponge after she'd done that. Bump! We felt it, didn't we? As the peach went over her. Oh, that lovely bump must have been for you, Miss Spider. It was very satisfactory, Miss Spider answered. Will you sing us a song about it, please. So the centipede did. Aunt Sponge was terrifically fat and tremendously flabby at that. Her tummy and waist were as soggy as paste. It was worse on the place where she sat. So she said, I must make myself flat. I must make myself sleek as a rat. As a cat, I shall do without dinner to make myself thinner. But along came the peach. Oh, the beautiful peach, and it made her far thinner than that. That was very nice, Miss Spider said. Now sing one about, about Aunt Spiker. With pleasure, the centipede answered, grinning. Aunt Spiker was thin as a wire, and dry as a bone, only drier. She was so long and thin, if you carried her in, you could use her for poking the fire. I must do something quickly, she frowned. I want fat. I want pound upon pound. I must eat lots and lots of marshmallow and chocks till I start bulging out all around. Ah, uh, yes, she announced. I have sworn that I'll alter my figure by dawn, cried the peach with a snigger. I'll alter your figure and ignored her and ironed her out on the lawn. Everybody clapped and called out for more songs from the centipede, who at once launched into his favorite song of all. Once upon a time, when pigs were swine and monkeys chewed tobacco, and hens took snuff to make themselves tough, and the ducks said quack, quack, quacko, and porcupines drank finey, finery wines, and goats ate tapioca, and old Mother Hubbard got stuck in the, Look out, centipede! cried James. Look out! The centipede, 
who had begun dancing wildly around the deck during the song, had suddenly gotten too close to the downward curving edge of the peach, and for three awful seconds, he stood teetering on the brink. Oh, by the way, chapter 26. He stood teetering on the brink, swinging his legs frantically in circles in an effort to stop himself from falling over backwards into space. But before anyone could reach him, down he went. He gave a shriek of terror as he fell, and the others, rushing to the side and peering over, saw his poor long body tumbling over and over through the air, getting smaller and smaller until he was out of sight. Silkworm, cried James, quick, start spinning. The silkworm sighed, for she was still very tired from spinning all that silk for the seagulls, but she did as she was told. I'm going down after him, cried James, grabbing the silk string as he st started, as it started coming out of the silkworm, and tried, tried the end around his waist. The rest of you hold on to the silkworm so I don't pull her over with me. And later on, if you feel three tugs on the string, start hauling me up again. He jumped, and he went tumbling down after the centipede, down, down down toward the sea below, and you can imagine how quickly the silkworm had to spin to keep up with the speed of his fall. We'll never see either of them again, cried the ladybug. Oh dear, oh dear, just when we were all so happy too. Miss Spider, the glowworm, and the ladybug all began to cry. So did the earthworm. I don't care a bit about the centipede, the earthworm sobbed, but I really did love that little boy. Very softly, the old green grasshopper started to play the funeral march on his violin. And by the time he finished, everyone, including himself, was a flood of tears. Suddenly, there came three sharp tugs on the rope. Pull! shouted the old green grasshopper. Everyone get behind me and pull! There was about a mile of string to be hauled in, but they all worked like mad. And in the end, over the side of the peach, there appeared a dripping wet James with a dripping wet centipede clinging to him tightly with all 42 of his legs. He saved me, gasped the centipede. He swam around in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean until he found me. My dear boy, the old green grasshopper said, patting James on the back. I do congratulate you. My boots, cried the centipede. Just look at my precious boots. They're ruined by the water. Be quiet, the earthworm said. You are lucky to be alive. Are we still going up and up? Asked James. We certainly are, answered the old green grasshopper. It's beginning to get dark. I know, it'll soon be night. Why don't we go down below and keep warm until tomorrow morning, Miss Spider suggested. No, the old green grasshopper said. I think that would be very unwise. It will be safer if we stay up here through the night and keep watch. Then, if anything happens, we shall be ready for it. And that is where we shall end today. I have a couple questions. So what shocking thing does James learn about the grasshopper? So the grasshopper told him that he plays his music a little differently, right? So he rubs one of his legs against his wing and it sounds like a fiddle, which is a violin. What are some of the details that we learn about some of our bug friends that they tell James? Well, first, the earthworm talks about how he eats the soil, which sounds disgusting, doesn't it? But it actually makes the soil really good for planting things. So if you see little earthworms, you'll see them sometimes when it rains, they come up, but then scoot them back into the dirt because they'll make your dirt nice and ready for planting. The ladybug, what does she do? Miss Ladybug is, um, and her other relatives, the other ladybugs, they eat tiny little bugs 
that eat plants. So farmers really like ladybugs because they come in and they only eat those bugs. They don't mess with the plants. So they're really good for your crops. Hmm. What about Miss Spider? What does she do? She spins webs and eats all the bad bugs in your house. So if you have gnats or flies or things, she catches them in her web. But not many people like her, do they? I'm not a big fan of spiders either, but now I'll think about them a little bit differently. And lastly, does anybody like Mr. Centipede? No, he's a pest. <laughs> but what happened to Mr. Centipede? What happened? He was so into his song, he was dancing, and then he fell over the side of the peach and fell and fell and fell. But how did James help him? James told the silkworm to spin as fast as she could, and he tied the rope around his waist, and he jumped off the peach after Mr. Centipede. So, he jumped off, and he swam through the ocean until he found Mr. Centipede, tugged on the string three times, and they pulled him back up. So he saved him, but not his boots. So we leave our friends at their first night floating through the sky. They're going to stay up top just so that they are ready in case something happens. I can't wait to keep reading with you all. I apologize for my dog whining during the video today, but we were so far into it that we had to keep going. So I will see you all next time with more chapters from James and the Giant Peach.